So I guess we'll get, we get started. We, the, oh, I guess. we gotta let our fans get in here first. You know. <laughs> They're just having a hard time Pouring making their the way door. through the line, probably. You know, give them a minute or two. Right here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the we are. What's that? It's not the numbers, it's the enthusiasm. That's right, That's right. totally. Yeah, I didn't see that at the last panel. <laughs> We are the Coin Rejects. We do a monthly-ish podcast on classic arcade game collecting and repairing and all kinds of things associated with that. So if you're into the games you see in the Free Play Arcade, that is what we talk about on a regular basis. Um, you can find us on the web. We're at coinrejects.com. You can subscribe in iTunes and Stitcher like a normal podcast. Um, and yeah, we basically talk about anything you guys want to add to that, all things collecting. Are you saying we're abnormal? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> so yeah, just um, we're arcade collectors. Basically, we have um, coin-operated video games, and uh, we just talk about the perils and pitfalls associated with that as far as finding the games, uh, fixing the games, playing the games, too. We also make sure that uh, for every episode, we play a game, and we'll try to discuss that game in depth. and. Um, you know, just kind of impart any knowledge we may or, or may not have, and then we just make stuff up. And have a friendly high score competition at the same time. That's right, that I always lose. <laughs> <laughs> so we have 16 episodes so far. Here's some graphics from those episodes going back to the beginning. Um, and I think we'll introduce um, ourselves, starting off with Jordan as he's drinking some water. Yes, okay, so I'm Jordan. Um, I, me, and a guy named Jeff Shanholes founded the Portland Arcade Collectors um, back in about 2006. I think that we have like 150 members approximately now, and so a lot of the games you see at the Free Play Arcade and uh, some of the ones in the uh, museum area too pretty much came from us. Um, I got into it just, I was playing games as a kid, you know, so I think from when I was about six years old. Um, all I really wanted to do was play video games. They were everywhere for people who don't remember, um, you know, the early 80s, video games were everywhere. They made a lot of money for people, so, um, you know, operators would put them wherever they could. There would be a video game at the Safeway, there would be a video game at hotels, and of course in arcades, there were video games in doctor's offices, uh, they were everywhere. And um, being a kid, I didn't have a lot of quarters because I didn't have a job. And uh, my friends or my parents weren't like super rich or anything, so they wouldn't just give me money. They thought it was just like a big waste of, you know, waste of money. You're just like throwing money away. Why would you do that? And uh, so as I uh, got older and I realized that you could actually buy arcade games, and it just was like mind blowing to me. So when I got a, like enough room in my house to have arcade games, um, that's when I just started, you know, looking for these things and buying them and uh, collecting. Um, I'd always been, you know, involved in various hobbies and uh, some electronics repair had, you know, come across my bench from time to time and kind of figured out that, well, these games are old and they were really probably not designed to be working 30 years later. So a lot of times there would be small issues that would crop up. So um, I had to learn how to fix these issues or else I would just have a bunch of big boxes that didn't do anything. Um, so I started learning about, you know, repair the games. Um, probably got most of my knowledge from a, um, arc or a, yeah, an arcade internet forum called KLOV Clov. And um, it's a pretty much a treasure trove of, of information um, about you know, all the repairs, all the stuff that, you know, all the things that other people have encountered. Um, you know, I met a lot of people from there. Uh, and then kind of learned about um, restoring games as well. Like, you know, figured out that, well, just because this cabinet says one thing, that doesn't mean that that's actually what that game started out to be. You know, in the classic era, every cabinet was made for the game. Uh, somewhere in the uh, late 80s, pretty much, cabinets became more um, universal, generic, converted to where you could just pop different game boards in and everything just had a joystick and some buttons. Um, so kind of, you know, finding those games and putting them back to their, uh, the state they should have been in. Um, so from there, uh, I just, you know, couldn't stop collecting games. 
and um, I usually I've got an arcade in my basement with usually about I think 35 games or so of my of my favorites, all pretty much um, uh, late 70s, early 80s, I suppose, early 80s, I guess. And um, you find that you always need spare parts and stuff. So it says here I hoard broken monitors and PCBs. A lot of times those are actually projects that I was unable to fix that I just like throw in a corner and one day I think I'll get smarter and maybe be able to fix them. You never know what you're going to need, right? That's right. You don't so know what you if need. If you find it, you need to grab it and hold on to it. That's right. They don't make this stuff anymore. <laughs> so. so next up, Brandon. Yep. Okay. Um, my name is Brandon Coleman. Started collecting in uh, we look uh, 2007. <laughs> uh, Co-founded this uh, podcast that we're talking about and with Brian. Uh, I started off in probably like early 2000, mid 2000s. I started out with a Sega Astro City cabinet, which is a Japanese cabinet from Sega. And uh, the reason why I picked that cabinet is because you know the era I grew up in was mainly JAMA and 90s games, and that was the uh, uh, the scene, I guess, for collectors of that era. Um, but what I realized is, uh, you know, later on that these games are kind of repetitive and kind of boring because you just insert a quarter over and over and over again, and uh, you know, continue, you just, continue, continue. Yeah, I mean, you just get kind of sick of it, and then there's an actual ending of the game and all that. There's a story, and it's a little bit too much. <laughs> and once you, once you know that story, you know, you don't really want to play it again. Uh, so. I uh, met with Jordan and a lot of the local collectors, found Klav, like Jordan was talking about, went over to Jordan's basement and just basically played all the, these classic games and I played, you know, of course I played these games in the arcades as well, but um, just knowing that there's a scene out there and there's other people that collected these earlier titles that kind of intrigued me to, to kind of join the group. Um, so yeah, I discovered games, classic games later in life. Uh, I guess last year when I wasn't here, you guys put uh, the dad on all. <laughs> Explain the dad on all high score boards. <laughs> One of the first games that I bought was Asteroids Deluxe, and it had, uh, you know, it seems like these random people will have one game in their house, and the whole family will play it, and the dad's always the best. So there's always dad on the scoreboard, you know, and it's like I get this Asteroids Deluxe home, and I just fire it up, and I see dad up there. And, um, <laughs> and I was like, I got to get that dad score off there and put my initials on there. And uh, so, you know, every time we joke around or go over to each other's houses, we put dad on each other's scoreboards and just piss each other off, basically. Um, Try to get a really high score so they have to really work to beat it. Yeah, and when I finally beat it, uh, Ian came over and he put dad on the scoreboard. <laughs> and, uh, and that took me another couple months of practicing to beat that score. Um, I love 80s culture and nostalgia. I think, you know, once you go back to your childhood and kind of look at all the, the happy times and the, you know, the carefree world of, you know, when you were a kid. Um, and then you also realize that all these games were around at the time, but you know, you know they were kind of invisible to you because you're too busy, like, playing outside or whatever. But I, I, never, really cared, <laughs> I never really cared about uh, the classics when I was a kid. I, I think I played a couple of them, but it was mostly Nintendo and um, yeah, I like pizza and beer. There you go. So that's it. Ian, you're up. Hey, I'm Ian. Uh, I've been collecting for about six years, and I started out with uh, Broken Tempest, and I've continued buying lots of broken games since then, some of which I've actually fixed. Uh, like Jordan, I, re I remember when video games were everywhere. You couldn't go to a convenience store, video rental place, for those of you who remember what those are. You know, laundromat, uh, anywhere you went, there were video games. And uh, so I just always loved playing those. And I uh, was real amazed when I figured out that they didn't cost, you know, $5,000 each. And uh, started buying them up. So I eventually fixed that Tempest and then traded it off for some other games. and. Uh, got into collecting minis, so most people are familiar with the upright style, uh, pretty standard video game cabinet, and also they have the cocktail style where you sit down and usually there's two players, one on either side, but they also made mini upright versions and they typically have wood grain sides and are a lot lower production than the full size, 
So I really got into those, and I've got just a ton of them now. Um, you know, 35-ish, I think, just minis. So that's really cool. I like figuring, you know, finding those. It's a little bit harder to track them down, so, you know, it's kind of fun. And I've gotten uh, into fixing the games. When you, yeah, I feel like if you have more than a handful of games, you really should know how to fix them, because any repair, if you take it out somewhere, it's going to be 100 bucks or more, and the game is going to be down. And being able to fix them all yourself is really great. So now I also hoard uh, test equipment to fix all my stuff. And uh, unfortunately, I, I'm continually running out of space, so my game room is pretty packed, and it's kind of exploded into my garage, and uh, my work is nice enough to let me keep a handful of games out there, and I have 10 machines out on the floor here. So minis and vectors are what I'm into. Tempest Mini is one of my favorite machines. Uh, I didn't bring any vectors this time, but I did bring a big pile of minis, and I have all the Atari mini vectors and uh, Omega Race, which is the only uh, Valley Midway uh, vector, all in mini form. Sorry. I'm Brian. I um, have a similar story to Jordan's. I was also a child of the 80s, so I remember video games being a big part of my life and always playing them just continually at the mall, at Putt Putt at the grocery store, anywhere you'd go. Um, that transition to collecting arcade, or not arcade, but game consoles, lots of the consoles that you see here today um, on, the, on the show floor. And so I would collect consoles and games and stuff like that. And I came about uh, a Williams Joust on, in the classifieds, it was before Craigslist. And I was like, wow, there's a Joust, and it was around $150. And I was like, wow, that seems kind of affordable. I think I could do that. So I bought Joust, and this was kind of like my ultimate console, as I have an arcade game. It's like, I, you know, where can I go from there? It's like, I'm not going to get more than just one of these gigantic wood boxes with a, with a television inside. It's like, that would, be, that would be crazy. Um, and so I had that for a while, and it kind of broke, and I got it fixed. Um, and then it would break again. And I, once I moved to Portland, I looked, I looked the, Portland retro, or the Portland arcade collectors up. And I was like, well, let me meet some people and see if I can figure out how to, to work on this game because I wasn't too, um, I wasn't too electronics inclined. So that's that's what I did. I think I remember one of the first um, fix it parties we went to. Brandon helped me fix the sound on the joust and um, just kind of went from there. And, and I went to George's basement like Brandon did, and I was like, oh my gosh, there's 35 games in here. Why do I have just one? This is ridiculous. <laughs> and so immediately I went on the hunt for my next game, and um, so far I've amassed about 10 games. So I'm, I don't have as many, quite as many as, as uh, Jordan or Ian, but um, I've got six games in the house, and then, of course, an overflow into the garage. And I've, I've been learning to fix and restore the games as I've gone. I'll show you um, one that I worked on a little bit later in, in the presentation. But yeah, I think that's a common theme with all of us is not enough room for the games um, because they're, they are so massive. It's a common theme among most collectors, I know. Yeah, definitely. I've probably been out of room for like five years now. So I, I try not to even to look for games anymore. Because if I find one that I want, then I have nowhere to put it. Yeah. ends up out in the garage or shop or something. The, the good and the bad thing about having a community of collectors is that everyone enables each other. So, you know, you might not even be looking. Yeah. And then now Brandon sends you, oh, hey, here's, here's a Klax Mini for 280 bucks on eBay. Buy it now. And you're like, well, And you bought right. it. In, you bought it in like 30 seconds. Yeah, I think I bought it and then replied back to you. <laughs> it's hard to pass up deals like that. There was another instance where there was a whole, someone was selling a whole group of games. They just needed to get them out of their basement because they were moving. And they were selling them $150 a piece. So there was eight games. And a lot of us will be on an IRC channel during the day and we're like, oh my god, did you see this Craigslist ad? And they're like, yeah, I did. I'm texting them right now. Do you think this is for real? And we found out that it was, and like um, Ian, myself, and, an, and another one of our um, members headed out there and basically cleared the place out of seven of the eight games, yeah. which was pretty awesome. <laughs> swarm of locusts. Yeah. That's the swarm of locusts. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> if, you, if you get this many games, your garage could look like this. <laughs> oh man, they only have one layer. <laughs> <laughs> so there's kind of many different 
kinds of collectors and I think you kind of go through different stages and I think we all start out as players and fans of the game so you just you want to get them and you want to play them and like we're all talking about once you play them and once you have them you're like oh my god I've got to fix them so you you learn a little bit more you learn how to fix you meet some people I met all these guys through through the hobby um, go to parties in people's arcades and then sometimes you go back and you look at your games and you're like, well, this, this game used to look a lot better when it first came out. Maybe I should get some more T-molding on the edges, or maybe I should repaint the sides, or put some new vinyl on or something like that. So you get into, like, restoring them, and people can go crazy into restoring where they make them almost exactly like they would have looked like coming off the um, factory floor. And then you also get into the hoarder status, which I think Ian and Jordan have alluded to, where you see stuff out there and you don't want to let it go. So you see a board come up and you grab it. You never know when you might need it. You see a bezel come up for a board for a game and you grab it because you never know when you might need it. Um, then you move your couch out. <laughs> <laughs> There's parts behind the couch. <laughs> You move your bed out of the bedroom. That, that's <laughs> funny because I have two boxed up brand new tubes behind my couch. <laughs> it's bad. Yep. Just, just in case I need Just yep. in case. The hoarder um, also goes to, as you see in all the games, they have CRT monitors like you used to have on televisions. And there's lots of old televisions that you can use the tube out of the TVs to do a tube, what you call a tube swap with the tubes that are in the arcade monitor. So whenever you see a 19 inch, 13 inch, 25 inch TV on the side of the road, you kind of do a double take and you're like, hmm, maybe I'll go back and, gr and grab that. So I think, I know Ian has a few t a few TVs in his garage and a few yeah. extra tubes, Yep. maybe I've, just a few. I have probably strewn about in my garage, in my car park, probably anywhere from 10 to 15 different TVs and I have a couple extra tubes. Uh, you know, some of these monitors use real uncommon tubes, and so even if it's kind of messed up, you're like, well, I'm never going to find another one of those, so I'm going to hang on to it. So I have, I have a couple of those shoved underneath some pinball machines. Yeah, so the uh, we put stages of collectors because a lot of people want to get into the hobby, but they're intimidated by it, and they think, you know, it's just playing games, and we're trying to get, you know, I use the uh, car collector analogy a lot, where there's, you know, basically these items up here verbatim for that hobby. You know, some people have garage queens or over-restored games, and some people just um, just like to fix them. And the games look like crap, but they they know how to fix them. Um, and there's people that are just players, you know, and competitors that actually just show up in competitions. Sometimes they don't even own games, um, but they're just so into the competitive aspect. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's not just collecting the game and playing it. There's many aspects to get into, and I think that's why we've kind of stuck around. I think a lot of the fun really is fixing the games, having um, that feeling of uh, accomplishment, I guess, when you take something that you know, doesn't work and, and you get it working again, and then um, I guess, yeah, sharing it with people. You know, it's like, hey, this didn't exist a couple days ago here, and here it is now. Have fun with it. And I think the conversation is part of it also is maybe it's a game that might be rare, maybe maybe no one has, has heard of it, maybe it's not even a good game, but you see it and it's available and you just have to have it because you don't want it to go into the landfill. So there have been, there are lots of people will do that as well, so it's like not necessarily like, I want this game, it's like, I need to save this game and um, go from there. Save it from becoming a multi -cade. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> which is what, what Brandon was talking about earlier. There's lots of converted cabinets that you can look at the way the cabinets are cut, and you're like, oh, that's a food fight cabinet. Oh, that's a burger time, because they have very, very uh, unique cabinets. So, Jordan, what, what do you, uh, what do you uh, categorize yourself as? Well, uh, my big thing, I guess, is uh, I really wouldn't have the games unless I could like share them with other people. I guess I just remember how much of a good time I had as a kid playing games and hanging out in arcades and stuff. So I just kind of want to recreate that. Um, and so I, yeah, my favorite thing really is to have people over and play games. Um, you know, I like restoring and fixing them, but once they're fixed, I don't really want to have to fix them again. Um, that, you know, it kind of sucks to do your same work over again. 
Um, and I guess, like I said before, I don't really um, look for games anymore just because I'm, I'm out of room. Um, there's a few, you know, really rare titles that I would love to have, but um, I think most of the ones that are known, you know, are pretty much in the hands of collectors and um, they're going to have to pay a pretty penny to pry them out of their hands at that point. So, um, yeah, I guess that's what I like to do. And uh, just so you know, we don't have bad grammar. We don't put you in front of everything when we write. <laughs> it's uh, the bullets didn't translate over, I guess, from Google's line. PowerPoint. We blame you. <laughs> yeah, blame Bill Gates for that. Yeah. All right. So uh, we just talked about different types of collectors, and you know, we say, hey, you know, what, after we've been collecting a couple of years, what kind of uh, collectors we are? What do we? What attracts us to the hobby? You know, when we're not playing games. So uh, I like fixing games. I like. Sometimes it's more enjoyable when the game breaks and uh, you just sit there and troubleshoot and research online and it's just kind of fun to get into all the old threads and all the old posts from the uh, late 90s and um, you know it's fun to go back and look at the architecture of the designs of the games, the programming, then you just kind of get in a rat hole and you're just sitting reading just some random stories and you're suddenly you're not even fixing the game anymore, you're just kind of reading about it and then you're like, you know, six months later it's your friends ask if it's fixed and you're like, no. And uh, <laughs> I, I accumulated all this knowledge. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and you, you get the tools, the knowledge to fix it, and uh, but sometimes it's just fun just reading about it. Um, so I think that's part of like the fixer aspect as well. You know, you get, we buy a lot of, you know, I got a signature analyzer, you got, everyone has a multimeter, uh, you know, EEPROM programmers, uh, but then when it comes down to fixing it, you know, you still have to learn how to do it, and that's one of the exciting things. Um, and I put player because, you know, after it takes six months to fix the game, then I'll play it. Um, but it's, it's never fun playing it by yourself, I think. I think it's fun when you're with a group of people, um, which is why I go over to Jordan's house, and, uh, or Ian's or Brian's. Um, so, I put player aspect, I think, kind of second because, you know, without the community and the culture, I think the playing portion wouldn't be as important to me. Um, and then restoring, um, sometimes it's more attractive, you know, or shocking to see the sticker price of a game that's actually complete and ready to go. I mean, you can get the Qbert I restored was, you know, it goes for like $1,500 now, um, but I've got the I got an empty Kubert cabinet for like 50 bucks. And so I spent, you know, a couple hundred in parts and now I have a pretty much mint Kubert, except for the cider. Um, you know, and so it's like, you could save money doing your own thing. Um, so restoring's, I think, an attractive part of the hobby. It's fun to take something from a, you know, a brown painted cabinet like Kubert was uh, to factory original condition or close to it. Um, and I think that, along with the social aspect, is what I enjoy about the hobby. You still have that Monaco GP? That's Ian's. Oh, yeah. That's Ian's garage. garage. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I still have it. It's, I still have it, and it still doesn't work. Speaking yeah. of Ian, yeah, you fixer, you player. Yeah, I. Oh my God, I'm getting upstaged. <laughs> Definitely on the fixer end of things. I really like. Uh, bringing these games back from the dead. Um, like, even just today, my Pac-Man went down and I went in there and got it up, back up and running again, so... That's really neat. And... And the, uh, the test tools to figure out what's wrong are pretty cool. I'm real into that. Um, and I've gotten a chance to save some rare stuff that way, too. So I have an Atari Pat 9000 test fixture, which I actually had out here last year. And there are maybe 200 of those made ever. And so, you know, I got that and fixed that. And so, sometimes you get into this rut where it's like, well, I need to do all this stuff to build the tool to fix the tool to fix the game. And that can be kind of a drag, <laughs> as hilarious as it is. But, you know, there's nothing quite like that feeling when you get a game and you get it up and running and playing right. Um, you know, I, I, th I think that's just awesome. And I do like to play as well. Uh, I kind of 
like to set goals for myself on scores. So right now I'm trying to get 250,000 on Ms. Pac-Man and I've gotten, you know, 209-ish. So getting real close. I like to just try and push myself a little bit on that. And yeah, I definitely, the fixing means that I have a huge hoard of parts just in case. And of course. sometimes they're busted things and I'm like, well, I, I should fix that. And sometimes someone says, hey, have you ever heard of Atari's uh, Monte Carlo? And I said, no. And he said, well, I have a Borg. Do you want it? Okay. You know, <laughs> I, I've never heard of it. It must be rare. So, <laughs> it's rare. So I got that. And then, yeah, I hoard the minis. Uh, I've got almost every Atari cabaret. I have all the Golden Age cabarets. Um, so that's, I don't know, eight, nine machines, something like that. And there are a couple prototypes I don't own yet. There's at least two protos that are known to exist or have existed. And I think there is a Hydra they made in a mini, which I'm not sure if I care about that. But all the early 80s ones I've got copies of and uh, Klax and Tetris from the 90s or late 80s. And uh, yeah, they're just, Atari games are so good and the mini form factor is great. So I really like having such a complete collection of them. I would consider myself a player first and foremost because I'm just such a fan of the games and that's what brought me into this hobby and is why I have games in the first place. Um, I put Restore a second just because I've, I feel like I'm a little bit more adept at, or um, a little bit more skilled at that as I've done some of the some of the work on some games, and um, I've, it's difficult, but it, it turned out pretty well. So I, I kind of enjoy the restoring aspect of the hobby and an aspiring fixer, just because I feel like I'm always learning. I, I don't feel like I could. Uh, uh, these guys are way more experienced than I am, but I'm always doing my best to to pull out the soldering iron and and. Uh, get a board out and, and fix something. And whenever it works, I'm excited. And then when it doesn't work, then I can ask one of these guys to help. So that's the, that's the good thing about community. Oh. What makes a good game? So um, we're, we're talking about some of the games that you might want in your collection or why you might want them in your collection. And I think I'm going to start off with um, one of the things I think is good for home arcades are games that have custom controls and stuff that can't be um, emulated well or that you can't use just a, a normal game, con um, game con controller with. And these are games like 720. This is a game that you'll see out on the show floor. And the interesting thing about this game is that Atari put a rotary joystick on it that there's no way you can really... Um, emulate that or reproduce it on a console and so the best way before I actually got this um, cabinet I'd always find the home system versions and they were just so lacking and so um, me also being a skateboarder when I was a kid and I used to play this as I went out skating um, this was kind of what what we call a grail game which is one of the games that I wanted the most and so this is one that I actually put a lot of effort um, to restore. I, I bought this from Brandon over here and um, bought all the um, artwork and pretty much replaced almost everything on this game. So I think, yeah, one of the, an, another good thing is to have the nostalgic collection or the nostalgic connection to the game, especially if you're restoring something because it's going to take you a good amount of time and to keep you going, you really want to have that end goal that you really want to get to. So I think that's a good one. And the next one I wanted to talk about was one or games that will run on unusual hardware or are unique in, in the hardware that they use. And my example is a Dragon's Lair, which is also on the show floor. This, the one that, that's out there is mine. Um, it doesn't look that bad. It, this, is, this is how it looked when I first got it. This was pulled out of a semi-trailer in, up in Seattle. Um, another aspect of this is I always like that when I see it in my garage nice and dry and clean, I'm like, I'm so glad that it's sitting here in my garage and not in that leaky trailer anymore because it was just there forgotten and rotting away. Um, but this is, this is a really fun game. Go to the next slide. Um, this was one that in, in 1983 was kind of thought to be the resurgence of the arcades and it was, a, it was based on laser disc technology. So this game actually has a laser disc player inside the game 
Like this. What movie this is, is that? actually a Space Ace that can also run in that cabinet. But before there were CDs, there were these gigantic discs. Um, so yeah, once I got this game, the there was no um, laserdisc player in it. I had to, didn't have the laser discs, of course. So that was fun to to hunt those down, to clean the game up and and fix it up as, as well as I could, and uh, get that running again. So yeah, those are the two things: is um, games that run on unusual technology and also games that have custom controls. So I think those are good candidates for your home arcade. Oh, this must be me. <laughs> so I guess this is a, one, a rather unique game that, that I own. Uh, it's um, Computer Space, which was the first uh, coin-operated arcade game. So to me, that's historical value right there. I mean, and um, it's very unique cabinet. Um, the gameplay is not great. Um, I actually have never even had it running 100% in the time I've owned it. So one of those projects that's never been done. One thing leads to another. Um, this game came out in 1970. And um, yeah, you just can't argue with computer space. It's a, it's a great game and I like to own it. Good for interest. And there's yeah, one in the museum, if you've been in the museum room, there is a, there is a two player computer space in the museum room. Yeah, I believe that belongs to Rick. And I think that one works. I think it might work. It's right? turned on. It's on? Okay, cool. And maybe there's another game that I like. Oh, I like Quantum. Look at that. So if any of you guys were in the... Uh, <laughs> Quantum's the only game you can draw dicks on, so that's why I own that one. No. Um, <laughs> vector. vector. Anyhow, uh, Quantum is a unique game because it's a vector game. I love vectors. I have pretty much all the Atari vectors, maybe minus a couple. Um, and uh, it was actually made by GCC. If anybody was here for the last panel, that gentleman who was here, that came out of his, um, that, that came out of, of GCC, his company. And uh, it was the, pretty much the last vector game. So vector monitors are totally different hardware than a television set. Instead of drawing uh, the whole screen at a time, they directly draw the graphics onto a black screen. So they didn't have to use as many CPU cycles, I believe, so the games basically um, played faster. Um, they were, I believe, the high-tech games of the era. A um, couple other things that you know nobody cares about. This was the only vector game that drew solid objects. Um, it is a trackball game, so you really need a trackball on a panel. You're not going to be able to emulate that with any kind of uh, hand controller, handheld controller. And then, of course, the vector monitor. The only console that ever had a vector monitor was a Vectrex, which they have a really cool display in the museum that would have been like the, uh, what would have been in a store to showcase the Vectrex. Um, so I like vector games. And try to draw that dick on a, <laughs> on a MAME or anything like that? It's not possible. Um, You're going to have the so, Yeah, there's an interesting feature where um, uh, if you get the high score of the day, you get to draw something. So. And that's what you chose? And that's, that's, that's what was chosen. Yeah. That's what most people do. It's kind of, it's kind of scraggly. <laughs> uh, not my best day. <laughs> All right. Um, I like games that don't get boring. You know, I go back to like earlier when it was like the 90s stuff where once you play it, it's kind of a novelty and it gets kind of boring. So um, when I got back into classics, I noticed that you know, there's no ending. So, hey, how can it get boring? You just keep on playing it over and over again, uh, challenging yourself. Um, but a lot of the classic games are very difficult. And so I've settled on a couple that um, you can ease into. There's a good learning curve and you can do good. You know, you can, sometimes you can get your top score in one shot or sometimes you'll die in like five minutes. So those games are attractive to me because, you know, there's just a lot of uh, replayability. Uh, Major Havoc um, is out in the museum next to Brian's Food Fight. Uh, they made 300 of them and it's, I think it's one of Atari's rarest production games besides Quantum. Um, I like it because it's diverse, it's fun. Uh, it was kind of Atari's last, you know, vector game besides, I think Empire Strikes Back was a couple years later and that was about it. Um, it's like the complete vector package. It's not just 
you're not just doing one thing. There's multiple levels. There's shooting levels. There's uh, there's even a mini pong game in between stages, uh, and it's you know no one else has it besides Ian now. <laughs> it's, got but, a, it's got a unique control too. Yeah. The roller. Yep. And so uh, one axis. you know finding games. One of the cool things is just kind of having a diverse collection and. Even though we all kind of share a few common games, I think it's cool that you know each one of us has a game that each other doesn't. Um, and so when I got this game, I mean, it was just it was the grail game for me, kind of like when Brian said seven twenty was his. And then uh, second game is Robotron. Um, it. The reason why I like it is because if someone else is watching you playing it, or if you're watching someone else playing it, it just looks like a bunch of scrambles on the screen. You can't really tell what's going on. And you're like, how is this person playing this game? You know? And uh, it's just, once you get into it, nothing else around you, you know, you just, you're just honed in on it. Um, and, you know, suddenly you're like, how am I playing this game with all this crap bouncing around all over the place? And uh, it just keeps, it just keeps me coming back. That's like one of the, the top things I like about um, classic games is, you know, the replayability, the speed, and the simplicity at the same time. You know, it doesn't need to be flashy to to play it. I mean, just gameplay and some graphics, and usually the uh, the sounds as well. I would add the control scheme too adds a lot to the game. Yeah, another custom one that's hard to to emulate and to get Dual right on a console. Well, cool. we're actually out of time, so I'm going to go real quick. <laughs> so I really like games that are just completely classic. A lot of these new games, I feel like they hold your hand a lot and they try to explain stuff, and it, that's a result of being really overly complex. Uh, I like games that are self-explanatory, maybe with you know one or two hidden twists. I think Galaga is a really great example of this. Completely straightforward gameplay, and then you figure out, oh, hey, you can let the mothership capture me and I can get double shot. That's really, that hits a sweet spot for me. I really like that kind of game. And I like games that you don't see in everyone's collection. You know, any game room you're gonna see in Pac-Man or Donkey Kong or whatever. So it's nice to see some games that are less common than that. So I picked, oh, wow, this got totally jacked up. <laughs> Anyways, so this is Death Race, which uh, I have a really sad one that's getting restored at the moment. Uh, it's a black and white driving game. It can be emulated emulated because it has no CPU. This game was from 1976, and at the time, uh, the pre year previous, Gunfight was the very first game that used a, a, C a CPU uh, that had come out in 75, but most games still were based on discrete logic. So it's a lot harder to troubleshoot. Uh, it only runs that one thing. You know, the hardware is the game. It makes it very unique, uh, really, really cool kind of uh, way of building it. And it has some of the most badass art. Just a, a really great art package on this game. Fantastic. Good outro music. Yeah. <laughs> and next slide. <laughs> next. Oh yeah, tax scan. So this is one of my favorite colors, uh, color vectors. This is a space shooter with a spinner. And it has this really immensely satisfying, heavy Sega spinner. It just it feels terrific in your hand. You have great control over it. Again, you know, not something that you can emulate very well. And vector games also look really bad emulated. Uh, it's just a really fun game. Really, really super gameplay. It's some of the worst hardware ever made. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, I have more money into this than almost anything else in my game room just because I had to replace almost everything. The uh, monitor uses custom parts. You know, you heard... Steve Bolson talking about designing custom ICs. The downside of that is that 30 years later when you need to repair one, there's nothing. So it makes it very challenging to get these up and running. The monitor uses multiple custom parts. The board set is you know five different boards with interconnects that fail. The power supply is notorious for failing. The monitor is so bad that they started putting these games out with this monitor and they started catching fire <laughs> and and they sent a memo around saying, we're going to bring a truck, just take the monitor and throw it in the back and we'll give you a new one. So that's the hardware platform this game is based on. It's really just the absolute worst hardware. But the game is so good and I'm so glad that I got it up and running. 
um, just a very unique game, and there are hardly any of them still in existence, much less running ones. Yeah, I'd never seen one before until I played yours. So if we haven't scared you away from the arcade collecting hobby, after all our horror stories, um, these are some of the resources you can use to get started. Of course, we talked about KLOV. Um, is a great forum just to browse around it, especially if you're interested, just to kind of look around. You can see what people are talking about, what people are doing, stuff that's for sale. Um, stuff that's being reproduced. Yeah, I'm speaking to the mic, man. Stuff that's being reproduced as well. There's a pretty good cottage industry that's cropped up for um, collectors as far as reproducing things that are not available anymore. Stuff like um, the art packages for the games, you know, the side art gets scraped up, you know, people write their name in them or bad words or something. Um, the control panels wear out from, you know, from love and um, controls break and, you know, and then even like whole PCBs are now starting to be um, reproduced. Um, so and that's, yeah, to get all of that kind of stuff, that's a good place to go. And our, our local collector group, once you're starting to collect games, you know, you can network with all us and we'd love to have you. And uh, just listen to our podcast as well. Jordan's basement's a good resource too. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions, burning questions? Now's the time. Are we giving away these stickers? Oh, yeah. we're giving away stickers. We have stickers, stickers in case you want. Yay. Come on up. Oh, Matt has a question. What's the game you're most proud of getting going or the one you, you know, what's your favorite of your Boy, that's a tough question a tough for me. Um, I like Dissatron a lot. That's a game that I really love and I will spend all the money in the world to keep that one going. And. Um, I don't know anybody else like local to me that has one, so I guess that's another thing too. You know, it's like, yeah, I got a Asteroids, but so does he, and so does he, and so does he. No big deal. But yeah, I guess I guess Dissatron is one that really resonates with me. It's a personal favorite. I would just say Major Havoc. I mean, I spent all my money on it, and uh, I didn't really do much to fix it other than you know clean it up, but. <laughs> Yeah, I think my favorite is probably my Food Fight game, which is in the museum um, for you to look at because I'm very protective of that game. <laughs> That's also one that I didn't didn't have to do too much to get it going. I bought it kind of at, almost as is. I did put the side art on it. But that's another one. The controls are, are custom to that game. It's another one developed by GCC, who Steve before us, um, his company developed it. But the, the controls are... are are not just your normal joystick. The joystick actually operates potentiometers so you can nudge your player in a certain direction but not actually make him move in that direction so you can like make him look in the different directions and direct his the food that he flings at people and so um, yeah that's uh, that's one of the games that's uh, definitely my favorite. Yeah I think Tax Scan is right up there. Uh, I would say Spectar maybe is one that I'm real happy I got going. It's actually out on the floor if you want to go play it. That's a game that grew on me a lot. It's got really terrible graphics, but the gameplay is so spot on. Um, and it's another one that you just don't see anywhere else. So, you know, give it a shot if you want. All right, guys. I'll ask the other side of that question, which is, what's the one game for each of you that you don't have that you want? Uh, <laughs> Why did you ask that question? <laughs> one game. Only one? <laughs> <laughs> well, Ian's secret is he wants all the games. That's fine. Everybody's games. <laughs> I, have, I have a diverse collection. Uh, man, there's, there's really not that much that is really high up on my list. I would say Quantum is probably near the top. I would definitely make room for Quantum even though they don't have it in a mini. Yeah, I was thinking uh, Bubbles probably. It's a Williams game. Uh, it's pretty rare and it's really fun and it's radically different from any of the other games Williams produced during that time. And it's kind of like a, you know, cutesy family type game so it wasn't really popular at the same time so uh, but it's really really fun to play like you know graphics aside of 
you know, style, I guess art style, how it looks. I guess my game that I don't have that I, that I like a lot is a game called Reactor by Gottlieb. And it's a really fun game to play. And uh, I, just, I just like the gameplay of it. Um, doesn't really, um, the cabinet looks fine and everything, but yeah, it's pretty much just all about the gameplay on that one. Unfortunately, it's like another one of these games that came out at the wrong time. It was like 1983, so they didn't sell a whole ton of them, and you know, ones got converted. And um, as far as the cost of one, it's they're they're up there pretty good. I mean, if you spend enough, you can pretty much get any game you want, you know. But um, you just have to decide what what that limit is. <laughs> I think I have a, a dual top of my list. I think the very top of my list would be Burger Time. It's not a rare game, but they don't come up very often. Um, it's another game that has a very custom cabinet. You can always tell the Burger Time cabinet um, if you just see the shape. But that, that's a favorite of mine. And the other one would be Tapper is another one that I like a lot. Um, it's on the, the custom controls with the actual taps that you use to, to control the pulling the beer or root beer, depending on which version you you play, but yeah. Simpsons would be the two. Simpsons too. All right. I'm well, sorry, everybody, I am you, the bearer of Everybody enjoy the veg fest. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we'll see you at the veg fest. Wait, are you <laughs> tell, you're telling us the panel is over? It is over. I thought you said bad news. <laughs> <laughs> well, bad news for the people that came out to see you. Thanks, and like everybody. Steve Dolson said to the previous person. <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, sir.